So hello everyone. Hello. Very honored to be here at Droid Kagi. Uh, I hope that all of you have a great lunch. Now it's time to love becoming a full stack developer with your Android skills. So I am Yasin Benabas. Nice to meet you. I am a DevRel at Wordline. I am also a teacher and a recent member of the Lille Android group. My name is Ibrahim Garbi. I'm a colleague of Yassin, also part of Worldline, and I'm also a mobile software architect. And we are from France. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> so, the question, uh, the, the beginning question here is, what can we develop with Kotlin today? So clearly, I think all of you know that we can do mobile, of course, with thanks to Android. We can do web. We can do desktop. We can do Backends. We can do also, Ibrahim. Data science. Data science. And that's what we'll, what we'll show today is that you can, with your Android skills, you can do all of this thanks to Kotlin. So first, um, let's have a look about the milestones done by the Kotlin ecosystem. So first, in the 13th years of uh, since the beginning of Kotlin language, uh, and we both. I uh, think that there is a promising future. So Yasin, can you give us the first milestone? Yeah, sure. So since the creation of Kotlin in 2011, uh, we have seen its multi-platform nature appear because it has been released at, as a JVM or Java target and also as a JavaScript target. And after that, we have seen the Kotlin, uh, the Android community adopt uh, Kotlin and uh, it has been uh, supported in Android Studio. And since then, we started seeing the appearance of Kotlin multi-platform. Can you maybe continue on that, uh, Ibrahim? Of course. Between 2018 and 2020, it was really focused on mobile and backend maturity in the ecosystem. So first, we had the enabling of concurrent programming thanks to coroutines. We had the Ktor client server approach that was released. Kotlin was first class on Android. We've got also the, the, the beginning of Jetpack Compose that will be key for Kotlin multi-platform approach and also the Apple interoperability that just came up. The last uh, milestone that we are actually today is really focusing on iOS and Kotlin multi-platform maturity. So we've got the, release, the stable release of Jetpack Compose. The Compose multi-platform was released with Android and desktop and uh, slowly later, Compose multi-platform for iOS. What is also great is that we have also a move on the Gradle build system, moving from Groovy by default to Kotlin DSL style, so meaning uh, programming in Kotlin for the whole application. We have got also Kotlin 2, uh, that was a release thanks to the last Kotlin conf, uh, announced in the last Kotlin conf, and uh, a KMP wizard dedicated to kickstart up your projects. And talking of KMP, Ibrahim, can you give us a little bit more detail about this? Sure. So first, Kotlin multi-platform stands for uh, KMP stands for Kotlin multi-platform. So basically, it's the ability to target uh, in a single code base multiple platform, meaning iOS, Android, desktop, and web. So basically, you have the library and the uh, Gradle plugin, uh, which is Kotlin multi-platform. It's enabling a single code base to be able to, 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 to program uh, your application on a single code base and having uh, some features that we see later on to enable specific logic for each target. Then we've got Compose multi-platform, the ability to have a common UI above Kotlin multi-platform, and uh, we've got uh, different level of maturity at this stage to be able to have the rendering for uh, it's in beta for uh, iOS, stable for desktop and for uh, Android, and in alpha for web. Continuing to the architecture, let's deep dive about the, the spirit of it. So basically, you have uh, the clean architecture that uh, you can kickstart right now. So I have a small example. Let's assume that we have a retail app. Uh, a retail app, basic retail app with some detailed uh, article lists. You can have the detail of your uh, article. You can add this article to your baskets. You have a payment tunnel where you can actually pay your, uh, your items. And uh, you have an iOS and an Android 
version of it. You can just right now kickstart a KMP project, uh, enabling uh, your KMP project with both platforms, keeping your specific code base, and slowly evolving your application. For example, you want to add a loyalty program inside your application, so you can simply starting up a common approach in the common code base, and you can have slowly and slowly uh, all your layers that are moving slowly to the uh, architecture. And what is really cool with KMP is that you can revert really easily the feature that you think that it's much better to have a native approach. So at the end, as we already uh, mentioned, Compose enable the UI, and we've got also the Gradle build system in Kotlin, so meaning you, ha you, are, f you, ha you are dealing only with the Kotlin language with all the stacks. So we talk about specific code, how we can make that. So basically, we have uh, on the Kotlin uh, multi-platform approach a keyword, a language keyword which is called expect. Expect can define a function, but can define also class. A, a class. It's like a contract-based approach. At the compile time, it will complain if you don't actually implement with the actual keyword the function you declare it on your common code base on each platform. So the it will complain you did not actually implement for this platform. Here you can see also other uh, important information is that you are referring to, you can actually have some SDK calls, so Android SDK, you can see that you have Android.OS, you can use UI kit, UI device to be able to retrieve the, the OS version, but you can notice that it's written in Kotlin, meaning that the SDK is wrapped and you can still continue to, uh, to, to, to uh, program in, in Kotlin even if you are using a uh, specific SDK uh, for each platform. Regarding the global architecture, uh, for Android users, you will not be lost at all because it's keeping the Android architecture uh, pattern. So you, uh, you, you can see that you have the UI layer and the data layer. And Right now, today, in 2024, lots of things moved. So almost everything is available. So for, com for uh, Composables, you have, of course, Compose Multi-Platform. You have the navigation available. You are, with Painter Resources, being able to get the images uh, in a multi-platform approach. For user preferences, also, we have KStore that is available uh, on all, for all the platforms. We'll see the demo later on. And for a network side, you have the KTOR client that is available. A bit of warning regarding databases, especially for web, which is in alpha. So it's still not fully uh, multi-platform for all the targets. We can also have injections thanks to COIN. We can have uh, asynchronous programming. We can have also other architecture patterns, such as block with decompose. So on the UI side, you mentioned comp compose. Can you? Uh, elaborate a little bit more? So it will be really quick regarding the front end. We have a declarative UI approach thanks to Compose Multiplatform. You will not be lost at all. You have the annotation Composable. You have your uh, Composable element. You can create your own. And everything is done thanks to the SKIA rendering project with the SKIKO library for uh, the different target to be able to render correctly the Composables, the standard Composables. R great. So I think right now we talk a lot about the theoretical part. Let's have a, a look on uh, a uh, multi-platform application, a web app. So you can go uh, check out uh, a quiz application that is just rendered here. So if you are an iOS user, I'm sorry, WebKit right now is not supporting WASP, so it will be a bit challenging to get the application. So don't hesitate, go ahead, try it by yourself, the experience, the Kotlin multi-platform experience. Or just take the link to be able to, to get it later on. Right, so let's switch to the explanation of this. So here it's a basic application of Quiz where you have uh, a welcome screen indicate with a single button to start up the, the, the quiz. You have 
a question screen uh, looping to the uh, data reach from a Ktor server provider where you can actually make a get and getting the quiz. And you have a last one that is uh, containing the score of uh, the quiz. So behind that, you can see that it's keeping the Android architecture pattern. You have a quiz repository uh, handling with different data sources that you could have. Here I have also a mock data source. And you have a quiz API data source that's uh, technically using Ktor client to be able to retrieve the data. So in live, let's see a Kotlin multi-platform project. So first, the ID here is Fleet. So Fleet is promoting Kotlin multi-platform. So it's basically uh, a good kickstart uh, to start up a, a Kotlin multi-platform project. And you can see here that you have a Compose app module. That uh, this is actually the new template. And with the Compose uh, inside the Compose app module, you have different source sets: Android. Uh, the common where you have actually your uh, common, uh, common, uh, common code, desktop, and uh, iOS. For iOS, you have a specific iOS module containing your uh, Xcode project and all the resources for an iOS build with Xcode build. So here you can see that finally for iOS, it's wrapping um, a view controller uh, on the, to, to generate the Swift UI view. For the desktop, you have single, simply the main function with the, app, uh, the, the uh, application uh, uh, DSL style declaration. And for Android, you have an activity, simply the activity that is available. Sorry. Okay. I think I will wait a bit to get. So this is, like I said, the iOS one. You have the, the the different code, so you have the content view that is a Swift UI view that is wrapping the main view controller, and the main view, view controller. Let's see. On the desktop menu, yes, you have the app that is a common code composable that I uh, created, and it's on the desktop is declared on the desktop. It's declared on the Android side inside the uh, common activity, the, the, the first activity, the root activity, so here. Regarding the, the web, the same, you have a Compose viewport able to interpret the composables that you have, and the same inside the main view controller with a, uh, for, for, for iOS. So now let's zip dive about the architecture we mentioned. So you have the data classes you have that you need for your application. You have the data sources with the different data source. You have the repository. You have the screens that you develop. And um, let's have a look to, 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 uh, to a screen. So on a screen, you can have your previews. And then you can declare your screen like you're doing in Android. So very easy to import some views. And you can preview it with a, uh, with a small icon here where you can have actually have a desktop preview uh, of your common code. So regarding the root of the application, I decided to have only one view model that is injected at uh, the navigate, uh, navigation side. So I have my different composables here that are declared. So the welcome one, the quiz looping to the questions, and the score uh, being able to get the data from the preview screen. I have also all my callbacks that I call inside the different views to be able to navigate and to make any actions that require the view model uh, calls. So now inside the view model, very simple. We are instantiating the repository. We getting the, the, the we are preparing the flow, and then uh, we are launching our um, 
coroutines to be able to get from the repository uh, the correct data. Inside the repository, you, are, you have a bit of logic, depending on what you have. If it's the first time and you don't have a network, you are mocking, you have a mock generation. If it's not, you, you, you are uh, executing the API data source. And if, and if you already have the, the data, since more than five, uh, less than five minutes, it's getting this from uh, uh, the shared preferences storage. So basically, this is the logic. Let's have a look to a data source. So the data source using Ktor client, Ktor client using DSL style to declare the HTTP client. So you can override this very easily in a Android style, and then you can call, uh, make the call thanks to a, get, a simple get, and getting the results on the flow. So regarding uh, the database, as I mentioned, if I'm targeting web, it's kind of challenging. So I decided to use KStore, which is more like JSON file storage. So I'm using it to uh, store my uh, data. So I use the KStore instance thanks to get KStore. And here, this is an interesting part because I need native calls for specifically to instantiate uh, my KStore uh, my customer instance, so I have the expect keyword there, and on each platform I'm declaring the key store depending uh, the way it's needed for each platform. So here it's for the web, for Android, for iOS I'm using NS File Manager to be able to instantiate it. For the GVM, the same, using specific actual definition. For Android, the same. And I think we are in. So the last question is, where actually, uh, I, uh, why I can uh, instantiate it correctly? It's because on my real Gradle file, I have for each source set the ability to declare my dependency. So I'm using here a version catalog. And uh, here, I am able to declare all the specific dependency for each. So WASP, iOS, desktop, and Android. So now it's time for running the application. So let's have a look. So you have run configurations that you need to prepare. Once it's done, you are able to, to run each platform really easily by simply clicking the, run the correct run configuration. And this is it. You have the desktop one, the Android one. The iOS one. And last but not least, the web was four platforms. Four platforms, one single code base. So I think we made kind of a guided tour about Kotlin multi-platform. Here is my wish list. So regarding the tooling itself, having a concise Brill Gradle file is under improvement. And I think definitely could have a game changer with Amper, maybe. Fleet improvement is needed. I still have some cache issues sometimes. Previews could be fully multi-platform, seeing all the targets and much more. For iOS, there is also a bunch of improvement, and it's on the way on the change logs. So basically, uh, having a build system that also covers Xcode builds natively on Gradle could be a great logging improvement and much more. Regarding the architecture, WASP support is now in alpha, so we expect more from the, the WASP part compose for, uh, for Compose for Web. And uh, also, there is some challenges I, 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 ch I shared regarding the, the databases, fully multi-platform. But we have now room for um, room, room uh, data, database that is multi-platform. And uh, we, we know that it's on the roadmap to have the web support. And maybe, why not, having exposed becoming multi-platform, we, we don't know. And uh, also better, maybe better dispatchers management in a multi-platform way could be also great. So yes, Sin, I think uh, we have this, the front-end overview. Can you please share with us uh, the back-end overview? 
Yes, uh, thanks, Ibrahim. So now let's uh, become full stack, meaning that we do more than just the front end. Let's do the back end. And hopefully for us, in Kotlin, we have many choices. So this is the list uh, which has been classified into three families, but there are many more. So thanks to Java support, Kotlin uh, can also be used uh, to, with uh, GVM frameworks, uh, Spring and uh, Quarkus. Uh, this is, has the advantage of using frameworks that are relatively uh, old with a lot of maturity and a huge community. But if you want really to take advantage of your Android skills, you can use uh, pure Kotlin frameworks because you have all the awesomeness of the Kotlin language there, extension functions, DSLs, data classes, and so on. And if you want to go exotic or try something uh, uh, different, you can use, take advantage of Kotlin JS and uh, write Kotlin code that runs on Node.js. Uh, there are examples in our repository that we'll share later when you uh, can see an example of uh, most of these uh, frameworks. Uh, regarding Kotlin for the back end, there are many case studies uh, where, of companies that uh, develop back ends with Kotlin. Uh, in most cases, it's a migration from Java uh, to Kotlin. Uh, and the, the, the feedback is always positive feedback, as far as I read. Um, because Kotlin is a more concise language, it has null safety, it has amazing features uh, like extension functions. So uh, developers are really satisfied uh, by migrating uh, to, Kot to Kotlin for the backend. So let's go back to our architecture. Uh, Ibrahim used the Kotlin server to provide the quiz through a get endpoint. But let's do something uh, crazier or funnier. Let's add another Ktor server backend. This time, this server will collect all the replies of your quiz. So when you reply to a quiz, all your replies are sent to another server, Ktor server, which collects all the data and then uh, provides a server-generated page which shows uh, statistics and uh, bar charts about the results. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about Ktor Server. Uh, so it's state-of-the-art server framework, meaning that it provides everything that you expect from a uh, server framework. Uh, how to develop REST APIs, uh, how to generate uh, pages from the server, uh, how to generate a Swagger do documentation, for example. So all of this is covered by Ktor Server. It's free and open source and it provides powerful DSLs. As you can see in the screenshot, uh, on the top side, you have HTML generated by Kotlin DSL, so we don't need to write HTML to generate our pages. And on the lower side, you see uh, a JSON endpoint uh, to retrieve, uh, to provide data as a JSON uh, format. Ktor also provides plugin support, which allows library developers to provide new features uh, for developers, but uh, uh, which will be easily integrated. Minim there is minimal setup and sometimes uh, there is no setup needed. So let's take a closer look through this uh, short video. If you want to start a Ktor project from scratch, uh, you can go to start.ktor.io where you can configure the basic information of your application. And you can also select the plugins or the libraries. These plugins uh, also provide sample code as starter code. So most of the time, you just uh, write your uh, useful code directly in the application. So once you select your plugins, uh, uh, HTML uh, generation, JSON generation, you can, uh, uh, a project is generated. Once you download and open the project, you can immediately add new routes uh, using uh, an extension uh, functions. Uh, here, we add some routes to generate uh, uh, CSS, to generate f images, to generate many, uh, anything that you can generate from a server. You can also, thanks to a plugin, uh, generate the Swagger documentation of your endpoints, which is very useful. And this is, this is also done thanks to a DSL, which is really simple and uh, easy to use. Here you can see that Ktor can render uh, HTML with the Kotlin X HTML uh, library. So no need to write pure HTML. You can write everything 100% in Kotlin. You can also uh, export SVG. You can do a lot, 
a lot of things. And once you're ready, you can just run your, uh, your usual Gradle job, Gradle run, to start the server. Auto restart is also supported. Here you see the home page when you run the server. For now, it's empty because we run a fresh server with no data. This is a sample uh, JSON endpoint, which is also empty, but you see the, you see what the, the, the point. And here, this is the automatically generated Swagger page. This is not generated from us. It's generated through, uh, by uh, parsing our code. And you see our documentation, which is reflected here. So this is the quick tour of Ktor server. Uh, that you can get right into it thanks to your Android skills. In the, when I showed the generated page, you have seen some bar charts. This is part of another interesting feature that Kotlin provides is data science. So let's take a uh, deeper look. First of all, let's highlight some features uh, that Kotlin provides for data scientists. Data scientists generally uh, like to uh, quickly uh, iterate quickly test uh, their code in a simple syntax and draw charts, manipulate tables. So, so that's what we'll see. So I can, maybe I ask a quick, quick question. Have you heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Yes. So lucky for us, Kotlin supports Jupyter Notebooks. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? It's a simple file, it's a file, sorry, single file that contains markdown, code, and the result of the code. Everything embedded is in a single file. That's an amazing file format, I really like it. And this file, the code in this file can be executed from many places, from IDEs, from certain uh, web pages, uh, IntelliJ Ultimate supports it, VS Code supports it, so uh, it's usable uh, by everyone. And even certain websites, such as GitHub, can render uh, in a really nice way the file itself. And what's also interesting about uh, Jupyter Notebooks is that they can support any language as long as there is a kernel for that language, which is just a Python package that you need to install. And lucky for us, we have kernel uh, packages for uh, Kotlin. As you can see here in the screenshots, you see that we write Kotlin and we see the result of the Kotlin code. Two other features that data scientists uh, love to use and are available in Kotlin are uh, plotting libraries. So this is Candy library that I used in the sample uh, before, and the data frame library, which is used to manipulate uh, tables, uh, large amounts of data with a clear and a nice syntax, as you can see here. So going back to our architecture, uh, let me show you how I used the tech, took benefit of the Jupyter notebooks. You see the bar chart below. In a normal way, we would have to, you know, write the bar chart code, run the server, see the result, make modifications, run the server again. So to have a faster development cycle, I did, this, did it this way. So I wrote a Jupyter notebook that downloads the results from the server and that processes it uh, in, inside the notebook itself. This allowed me to have a quick development process because with Jupyter notebook, you can go much faster than the traditional way of rerunning a server every time. So this is one way of using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so there is, you, you see here a website, you can open it on your phone to see the result live, uh, the live results of the previous quiz uh, that we highlighted. So since we don't have internet connection here, we just saw a sample result that you see on, the, on this web page. But you can go open the web page on your side at any time uh, to see the results. You see here also, this is generated through the Candy library and exported as an SVG to the HTML file. So let's take a small video, let's look at a small video uh, regarding Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so as I said, the notebook is a file that contains Markdown, Kotlin, or any other language, but in our case Kotlin, and the result of this code. So once you write all your code, you can click the Run All button to execute everything in this file and save it as it is. This exam in, in this part, we show that IntelliJ Ultimate supports Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and when you click, same here, the Run All, Run All button, you see the result of each block uh, below it. The result can be a text uh, formatted as a text, can be also images, 
and can be also interactive items. For example, here, when you hover over the bars, you see a tooltip with uh, some details. What's also interesting is that you can edit only specific blocks and see the result immediately. You don't have to re-execute everything. That's what allowed me to quickly iterate and experiment with uh, Jupyter, uh, with the, uh, the analyzing the, the, the quiz data. This is another some example showing a data frame library. And now that we have executed everything, let's push everything to GitHub and see what we get. As a reminder, the Jupyter Notebook contains the markdown, the code, and the result of the code. As you can see here on GitHub, you see that everything is displayed in a proper and clean way, even bar charts. This also means that we can use Jupyter Notebooks as a way to document and also as a way to teach uh, because it can be used as a lecture note for students. So that's it for the Jupyter Notebook part and for the data science part in general. Now let's also go uh, further in our uh, Kotlin uh, use and see a very small selection of new features in the language. So uh, usually when we want to expose a private property through a more restricted type, here for example we have a mutable list that we want to expose as a list, we would use this syntax. But thanks to Kotlin 2's explicit backing field, we can now write it like this. And this is basically what we can use on uh, flows uh, inside a view model of, or a repository in uh, Android or KMP. Another feature that is not already available, but it is still in discussion, and you have the URL to follow also the discussions and maybe interact, is the collection literals. Uh, this is also maybe for data scientists, this is also a nice feature for them, uh, because uh, also for Python developers, uh, this allows them to create collections in a much more concise syntax. It's not released yet, there are discussions, but I'm really uh, eager to see this feature released. And there are many more features that are coming with the release of Kotlin 2. Um, so please take a look at the official GitHub and the, also the X of Kotlin to follow and even interact uh, with the teams and with the community. So I think it's time for a conclusion. So after uh, this guided tour, Yasin, um, is it time uh, to onboard other part of the ecosystem of Kotlin for an Android developer? Of course, Mochir on this. Because thanks to Kotlin 2, uh, we have achieved great milestones. Uh, Kotlin 2 was released, KMP is now stable, it is now also recommended uh, on the Android side. Uh, the ecosystem, as you have seen, is very complete. It can, you can do everything in Kotlin from start to finish, from front to back. And also we, have, we are seeing a lot of frameworks becoming more and more multi-platform, more and more mature in all the areas of Kotlin. And regarding Android, Ibrahim? Uh, I have to admit, since my uh, 12 years I'm working, uh, that it's the first time of my career that I'm really enjoying making other stuff than mobile, and especially web back, uh, backend and data science in the way, DSL style way, uh, rem uh, using my Android skills for that. So I think we're running uh, at the end of the presentation. One last thing is mentioning that we have concrete use case on the uh, case studies on the official JetBrains website where you can find <coughs> even a worldline use case, uh, thanks to our great team in Spain. They work on the Aeroski project, which is a retail project. So uh, don't hesitate to look at. Sorry. <coughs> don't hesitate to look at, and there is many more use cases interesting. And last but not least, we are trying to uh, create with Yasin uh, an open source training 
uh, to kickstart and being uh, keeping updated uh, regarding Kotlin multi-platform and Kotlin features. So don't hesitate to go to go there to train yourself on other parts of the ecosystem, but also don't hesitate to contribute and uh, give us some issues if you have any complaint regarding it. And all the, the code, the videos that we showed earlier are available in these two repositories. Uh, all the samples are available there as well. And more to come. So let's, let's, I hope we uh, gave you uh, a motivation and a lot of information to go further than Android and love doing that. Thanks Thank for your you. attention.